Good morning, all you my friends. It's your friendly announcer. I'm serious news to pass on to. Tom, I've been chasing, and I didn't have to chase. I, I, I saw uh, uh, Tom in Guadalajara, Mexico in September, and he was the keynote at a, a conference for engaged scholars, folks that had doctorates. And when I heard his story, it was a great story, but the passion that he shared and those jewels of wisdom he kept dropping in the room, I said, oh man, Brushed him after he finished speaking. I said, are you ever in Atlanta? He says, yeah, I'm in Atlanta all the time. I said, one of those times, one of those times in Atlanta, if you'd be so kind to come and talk to our students, we'd be forever in your debt. And uh, we, we worked with him and his assistant, and they were able to uh, fit us into the schedule. And as you can see in this lovely campus that is extraordinarily quiet right now, this is our last week of school. So again, we thank the students for being here. A lot of students are already making plans to head home. Um, but we, we wanted to really have you come out and just talk to our entrepreneurial students and sort of drop some similar words and uh, jewels of wisdom. So if you wouldn't mind joining me on the stage, we're gonna go ahead and pull up this screen. And I'm gonna have a few questions for you and then we're gonna walk into the audience and allow the students and some of the folks that are here with us today to uh, ask a few questions. So thank you, welcome. Ah, thanks so much. Now, I, I usually start out these sessions um, getting checked if I did my homework. So I'm, I'm gonna ask you a few questions to validate that uh, I'm talking to the right speaker here. So uh, 20 plus years at the CBOE, which is the Chicago Board Options Exchange, is that correct? That's correct. It, oh. It's actually, last night was the 50 year anniversary of the introduction, the, the beginning of the exchange and really the introduction of listed options. Okay, okay. Um, clearly you are the uh, CEO and co-founder of Tasty Trade, and we'll talk about that in a moment. Yes. <laughs> um, clearly you are also known for having uh, developed the app Think or Swim, you're the co-founder of that, which you and your um, co-developers sold to TD Ameritrade? Yes, true. Okay, and is it also true, I was digging back in the archives, you originally was a political science major. I was. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll touch on that as well. Obviously a, a baby boomer, uh, those of us that have a few grays mm -hmm. in our head. Uh, and you started your uh, career out on Wall Street for Drexel, Brunham, and Lambert? Yeah. Drexel Burnham, yep. Okay, okay, I've done my homework, I've done my homework. I like it. Um, I'd like to ask you this question. Again, the students that are here, our effort that we're trying to create here is we're working on an innovation entrepreneurial center. Can you describe what innovation means to you and how that differs if at all, from entrepreneurship or how it's the same or how it's intertwined? Can you, can you give us some perspective on that to start out? Sure. Um, to be fair, you know, I've always considered myself first an entrepreneur. Okay. Um, innovation requires kind of a, just, it's, innovation is another word for vision. I'm, I'm not so sure that innovators are actually the facilitators I mean, they have the vision, but they don't actually do the work. Okay. You know, so, um, and an entrepreneur is somebody that kind of does the work. So the entrepreneur is the one that, that, um, that supports the vision. They're the ones that stay up. They're the ones that make sure it gets built. But the, um, the innovators, 
you know, that's, that, that's, that's a really smart group that have to execute, you know, that entrepreneur's vision. And I, I think that's the difference. It's a small, it's a tiny, it's a gray area. It's a little bit of a different distinction, but that's it. Now, now I started out with that question because as I watched the YouTubes, the different interviews you've done, some emphasize entrepreneur, others emphasize innovator. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about your journey through the two apps that you're most known for. Thinking. <laughs> Think or Swim and, yeah. and Tasty. Yes. Two crazy names of two trading apps. I don't know how many, there's obviously a large group of uh, traders in here, but there's also, I'm not sure how many of, you know, the students in here, how many of you guys trade on different platforms? Crypto, it could be crypto, it could be anything. Anybody? Yeah, a little bit, okay. Um, so, you know, one of the things that's happened over the, with the development of technology and financial, in financial markets, is that they've, they've kind of given access to financial markets and all strategies to virtually anybody. And so in, in the world that, I came from the trading floor world, which for me was kind of a, a pretty wild experience. So I'm gonna go back in time, just for, if you don't mind. Okay, no please. So, I was a political science major in the late 70s. You know, it seems <laughs> like it is really, you know, <laughs> a long time ago, 40 some odd years ago. And at the time, there wasn't really business degrees. I mean, as crazy as it was, I, I went to um, school in Albany and uh, State University of New York in Albany. And we didn't really have business degrees, so we picked from everything else more traditional. And I loved political science. I thought I was gonna be a lawyer. My dad was a lawyer. My sister was about to become a lawyer. I thought everything, or my family was lawyers. I thought political science, perfect. If I'm not a lawyer, I'll be a lobbyist. It all made sense. I got out of school, it was a recession. It was a pretty bad recession in the late, late 70s. And there were no jobs for any kids getting out of school. So I got, a, I got an interview on Wall Street and uh, they made an offer and it was the only job offer I got, so I go, I guess I'm in finance. <laughs> and yeah. I've been there ever since, and I, I fell in love with options, and the only place to trade options was Chicago, so I moved to Chicago, and I've been doing this for basically my entire life now, feels like it. Um, but it took us 20 years to learn. Like, the key, I think the key to, to being a really good innovator is having a really strong know-how of whatever the subject matter is. See, I'm, unlike the last person you showed up there, I don't believe that entrepreneurship is about problem solving. Mm. I actually think differently. I don't think it has anything to do with problem solving. I think people that try to solve problems in the world of entrepreneurship generally fail mm. because you're going after something that you're, you're worrying about somebody else's problem. I think really great entrepreneurs um, come up with a vision and they go after that vision and they don't care what anybody else thinks. Mm -hmm. And they don't care what the problem is because you, you can't like, you know, you can't solve for something that if something exists, you can't really create something completely new. And so I'm all about just building whatever, you know, comes to mind for us, whatever your area of expertise is. So our of expertise was, was trading options. So we built option trading platforms and around that you can grow into other areas of finance. And that's kind of, you know, the genesis of it. Okay. So you, you built this during the 1990s when there was the uh, internet bubble. I'm sure there's... Yes. Yep. Is, is that 1999. Fair? 1999. So uh, clearly that was an interesting time frame. I also participated in that, that time frame as well. What, what are some of the key lessons you pull from that that you're deploying today in terms of the... So I had spent the first 20 years of my trading career, finance career, in the trading pits. They don't really exist anymore, but if you've seen videos, if you've ever watched Trading Places or any of those crazy videos, you know, that was what we did. We stood in the pit with 400 other mostly big sweaty guys and you just, uh, you know, screaming your lungs out and trying to make a living and trading for, with your own money for yourself. Um, I did that for almost 20 years. But in 1999, at that point, the, you could see the writing was on the wall that we were about to move from open outcry to electronic market making. So we took a shot and I love telling the story because 1999 was kind of a crazy year. There, 
internet bubble was making anything with a dot com name on it. It's almost like it's almost like imagine AI today and just taking that and multiplying it by a hundred. Mm -hmm. That was dot com in 1999, 2000. So we were trying to do two things. One, move off the trading floor and take all the money we had made over the last 20 years and build something really cool with it. But the other problem was we weren't technologists. Mm. So we didn't know what to do. And all the technologists had been scarfed up by all the um, dot com firms. So we had a deal with figuring out how to build technology with no technologists mm. and limited capital, um, which was a challenge, but we did it. Wow, wow. What, what, what are some of those lessons you learned that you can deploy today? So we got cryptocurrency. We had a similar kind of sort of energy happening with new technologies, greater I, access. You know, um, more things being delivered at home after COVID. So there's some similarities. There's a lot of similarities. Yeah. What we learned in 1999 and 2000, well, we had to teach ourselves how to build technology, which like today, if you, were, if you were doing something similar, you'd be teaching yourselves kind of machine learning or some form of artificial intelligence, but you'd really be working on you know, machine learning. Um, but then how do you differentiate yourself? How do you differentiate yourself? You know, like at the time we had to differentiate ourselves from other um, uh, day trading firms and from other, you know, just kind of like kind of junky financial firms. And our differentiator was just that we were, we decided we're going to build really cool technology that nobody had ever built before. And then the question is, how do you do that? And at the time in 1999, we didn't really know, but we found, and this is one of my favorite parts of the development, we would hang around programming Olympics. So IBM mm -hmm. would sponsor programming Olympics. And IBM, and I think it was mostly IBM, they were the chief sponsor. And because I didn't know how to find developers. So I'd go to these programming Olympics and I would like try to talk to any of the kids that were in the top 10 in the world. And these are from universities like in China, India, Russia, and all these places. Finally, some kid from Russia um, said, all right, I'll have a coffee with you. Like nobody would even talk to me because these <laughs> kids were off the charts. So finally, some kid in Russia said, okay, I'll talk to you. And um, uh, these are kids that have been programming together since they were probably like, I don't know, nine or ten years old and super geniuses. And I finally convinced somebody to start a firm in St. Petersburg, Russia and four kids in a garage with no heat. And we started a dev firm in St. Petersburg in 1999. Wow. They still exist today. They're the largest fintech firm in the world with 1,100 developers, and they build basically all the exchange technology in the world. Wow. And back wow. in 1999, I started them with four, literally with four kids in a garage, but super geniuses, but no money. And part of my favorite part of the story is we didn't know much about technology as well, and they didn't know much about option trading. Mm -hmm. So we basically spent the next, I would say, three or four months locked in, locked in our offices in Chicago and pretty much didn't even go home. Wow. Like we just basically lived there and, and built and started to build the platform. We actually at one point had to reverse smuggle Sun Microsystem servers into St. Petersburg in their luggage because they couldn't buy Sun um, hardware in Russia. Oh, wow. So we built a whole system up in St. Petersburg so we could have a dev platform over there. And that, that began the process of building really cool technology. Over the next five years, we built the best um, trading platforms in the world, and that kind of, you know, that was our springboard. Wow, wow. Given that propensity for entrepreneurship, again, we have a lot it was of a young... propensity for risk. Propensity for risk? Yeah. Okay. More so than entrepreneurship. It was okay. really, we, we did, in fact, in 1999, the word entrepreneurship did not exist. Okay. Like, there was no such thing as an innovator or an entrepreneur. Remember, 1999, 2000, there weren't entrepreneurs. There were risk, risk takers. takers. That's okay. it. Okay, so for the young risk takers that we have in the room, yeah. what advice would you give them right now? Because you, you, if you, you talk to the universities, there's three yeah. tracks that you generally hear. You hear someone graduates, they get a job. Mm -hmm. The second you hear they graduate, they go to grad school. <coughs> but for those risk takers, entrepreneurs, innovators, what, what would you tell these young folks? So, so my speech on this stuff is really simple because I don't, I don't ever change this. <coughs> it, at 20, so I'll tell you my story and then you can, and you can take it for whatever it's worth. I was 22, 23 years old and I was working for Drexel. I was there for six months and some kid said to me, and they weren't a kid, maybe he was, I was 23, they were probably 30. And they said, listen, I just got married, I had a kid, and, but I really want to build a trading firm. So 
you don't, you're not married, and you move to Chicago, and we'll put up the money, and then you can go trade on the floor. And I said the next day, I packed my car and left the next day. Mm. Now, that's just because I don't know what was, I don't know what I was thinking. But <laughs> my advice is, and, and by the way, they lost all their money like 30 days later and I was stuck in Chicago. <laughs> so it wasn't like, it wasn't, all, it wasn't that easy. But my advice to anybody, and I say this to every group of kids that I talk to, whether it's grad students or undergrad, whatever it is, is take as much risk as you can, no matter what the circumstances are. Like we're about to release a brand new app. We just built an app, we haven't even pushed it out yet. And it's an app for young people. It's, it's actually called Bad Trader. And we're pushing it out at the end of this month. And this app is designed to teach kids pure speculation. Mm. Like everybody, if you've heard of platforms like, you know, Acorn and, and Stash and, and um, uh, Mint and all these platforms that teach you how to save and teach yeah. you how to, you know, wake up 30, 40, 50 years from now and have all this money saved up. I absolutely despise that. I'm a huge fan of taking as much risk as you can at any point in your life with your capital and make as many decisions as you can which teach you how to assess risk, how to take risk, and at every opportunity you have to take risk, you should take risk. Mm. And that's the way we approach a completely different approach to, to young people just you know, deciding what are they going to do with their money. It doesn't mean you have to can't get a job. It doesn't mean you can't, you know, you can't work for somebody else. It doesn't mean you can't learn how to network and learn how to get involved in whatever industry it is you love. But when you have an opportunity to take risk, if that's what you want to do, do it. Okay. Okay. Now, uh, 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 this is going to be somewhat of an abstract. I've uh, started a lot of programs where so I've talked okay. to folks that have had a uh, tremendous amount of success. And, and, and it always sort of boils down to this sort of uh, interesting uh, analogy, they say. They, 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 in essence, say you really should only have two types of people you're walking with. One of them is someone that's as hungry as you are for what you're going after, as hungry as you are. And the other is someone that's already been where you're trying to go, so they could sort of mentor you from wisdom. If that is in fact true, something like that, who, who do you move with that is as hungry as you are to do the things that you're doing? And, and who is your mentor? Who do you turn to for mentorship? So, so and it's an abstract. I, I, I understand. Yeah. So, so, we, so I don't really, that, that, I don't have a, so, so I live in, I grew up in the world of business in a very weird environment. You have to picture like a, a big giant trading pit with like 400 alpha males or 500 alpha males, all, all screaming, you know, we were all virtually the same people. Okay. There wasn't that much difference. So there wasn't somebody that I necessarily looked up to, but when we started building businesses, we did exactly what everybody tells you not to do, <laughs> which is partner with your friends mm. and build stuff and I partnered with my best friends and we're still together today, 35 years later, wow. all the same people wow. that I've met 30, 40 years ago and we have built many businesses together and we've figured out how to deal with each other and challenge each other. Okay. We have one simple rule, no high fives. Okay, no high fives. No okay. high fives. Okay. So you're always working for some, and, and there's never a time when you get to stop and say, hey, you know what, this is really great. This is, we did something really cool. Never once. Wow, 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 wow. It's a little scary, I know. It's kind of a sickness, but it's fun. I'm, I'm gonna take a moment to reach out in the crowd to see if there's any questions. Uh, I encourage my students to come here and, and ask a question or two. I'm going to turn to my right here and see if I can uh, pull a question out of them. Right now, I'm in college, and there are a lot of opportunities where if you work a little harder, you could come upon some extra money, whether that's a scholarship, a grant, you know, whatever. What would you say your next best like, option would be for yourself, considering that you're a risk taker, if you were to get a scholarship for $5,000? What, what makes the next best logical sense to you for someone my age to make a next step? Is it to research and kind of invest the money a certain type of way? Or is there a different path that, you know, might be less traditional that people don't really talk about? 
Well, you're, you're probably asking the worst person in the world for that, okay? <laughs> um, you know, so like I said earlier, I, I'm, I'm going to go off a little bit on a tangent here, but how old are you? 20? 21. 21. See, when you're 21, a couple thousand dollars, like you, you have your entire life to build wealth and to do whatever. You know, whatever you're going to do, whatever you're going to become, you know, at this point right now, what you're doing is you're teaching yourself how to make decisions, how to take risk, and how to speed up. Like to me, success, real success, is a derivative of how fast you can make decisions and how good those decisions are when you make them. And the problem is that very few people understand that in order to get yourself to that point, you have to make lots of decisions. So like you can't just, it just doesn't come to you naturally. You're not gonna turn like 23, 24, 25 years old and all of a sudden you're a great decision maker. Okay, because you're still gonna be the same place you are when you're 21. So what I like to tell people, and this is completely something that nobody else would ever tell you, is, and it's not self-serving because I actually believe this and I think that's one of the reasons that we've been successful, is I like you to find a way to make as many crazy decisions as possible. And, and in the process, of course you're trying to be successful. The reason I like the financial markets is because they're efficient and they're cheap. But you can do it if you wanted to trade, you know, if you wanted to buy and sell sneakers on eBay, couldn't care less. But it's just a function of how many times can you make a decision where there's some form of a monetary outcome or some form of an emotional outcome that makes you think about what you just did like statistically, probabilistically, however. But the more times you do something like that, the more decisions you make, the quicker you're gonna to start to make, you know, uh, the quicker you're gonna make decisions going forward and the more articulate you're gonna become about taking risk and, and doing different forms of business. So the thing I love about finance is that you can apply the decision-making skills in whatever way you want to articulate that for whatever career path you want to go down. So for me, the $5,000 doesn't mean anything. It's how many decisions can you make with that $5,000 that can take you from your education here to some other level that, that every other 21 year old is not at. You know, your, your success is going to be a lot based on your ability to differentiate yourself from the person sitting next to you and the person sitting behind you. You know, that, that's a really good question because you, you never know. You, know. you know that. Like you've studied, you know, through your, what year are you in? Oh, freshman. Freshman. Okay. Well, as you go through your studies here in business, you're going to see that there's going to be some stories where like, you know, like it's really hard to do what some really successful, you know, like unicorns have done or the crazy outliers like, you know, a Zuckerberg or a Bezos or something like that to hold or Musk, to hold things on for, you know, tens of billions or hundreds of billions of dollars is just absolutely amazing because it's really hard to do. Just like you said, you know, what do you do when you start building something and then somebody offers you, you know, money for it and you're like, wow, this is life changing. Um, so, so we have a rule and the rule we have is you're never, there's no, there's no, you never have um, an exit plan. But you have a, in your head, you have a reasonable valuation of what you're worth. So let's say you build something and you think it's worth $100, right? You're never going to sell it for $100 because you built it and you want that and you, and you want it to see it go higher. And if somebody offers you $120 for it, even though you think it's $100, you're still not going to sell it. But even though it's $100 value and it may go to $1,000, it may go to $10,000, if somebody's willing to pay you $200 or $300 for it, which you think is your offer, because you always have to have a bid and offer. If you think that's your, a reasonable offer, two times what it's worth, then you probably sell it. So we've always got, we built two companies in the last 20 years. Each one we sold for about a billion dollars. And each company, we never got any bids until we got to about a billion dollar valuation. Or we never got a bid that we felt was fair value or above fair value for us. And that's how we did it. Each person does it a little differently. But remember, 
One of the keys to being a, a really good entrepreneur is you raise money and you sell something when you can, not when you have to. Because when you have to, you never get value. When you can is when you get value. All right, who else do we have over here? We got a lot of young entrepreneurs sitting here in this crowd. And I may even walk over to the not so young entrepreneurs over here. Do we have a question on this side? All right. And, and I'm counting you as one of the young entrepreneurs, just, just so we, we're, we're clear on it, okay? So Tom, you, you, you built two training platforms. You said the first one, you guys wanted to create something that was cool technology. But from an outsider looking in, you did something totally different with the second company. And with Tasty, you, rather than creating some cool technology, you created free but valuable content that you gave away. Then you created technology, and now those of us that use that technology gladly pay you for the use of that technology, because it's good technology, it's fast, it works great. So at what point, I mean, you were doing the Friday session, you know, when, back when you were at Thinkorswim, but at what point did you pivot and say, we're gonna create content first, then technology? So I'll tell you what, what, uh, what Bobby's saying. So the first platform built was a technology platform, and I'm not sure if any, you know, not obviously everybody here has used it. It, it's still, it still exists today, it's Schwab, it's their main trading platform. But when we built it, it was really cool technology that nobody had built before for derivatives. But we got, when we sold it, we're like, there's a piece missing. And it bugged me. And the piece that was missing was we built this crazy cool technology that serviced all these markets, but we didn't build the supporting content. And so to turn on an entire generation or, or you know, a, a or multiple generations to financial markets, we felt we were missing content. Because CNBC, most people watch CNBC, I didn't like it. I don't care what other people think about markets. Other people watch Bloomberg, it didn't work for me because I don't care what other people think. What I'm looking for in financial media is somebody that can talk about strategies, somebody that can actually talk about, you know, about numbers and statistics and probabilities and, and provide something that my brain can relate to. Like, if you told me you were bullish or bearish on the market, it doesn't mean anything to me. It's just, great, you're bullish or bearish. What do I care what you are? Because I'm going to think differently than you. But if you told me some math formula that gave me, let's say, expected move in an underline, then all of a sudden, if you said to me, you think the value of this iPhone is going to go up or down, I would say, I don't care what you think, up or down. But if you told me that the value of this iPhone is only going to move $10 higher or lower over the next year, then all of a sudden, if there's a strategy I can, I can employ around that, then I'm interested. And that was the genesis behind building Tasty. And everybody told us, you know, you can't compete with CNBC, you can't compete with Bloomberg, you can't, nobody's gonna watch your show about numbers. And the reality is, you know, we ended up building the largest digital financial network in the world based just solely on personalities and, you know, stupid chick chat and, um, and, uh, and numbers. So, again, given that we have uh, from 18 to 24-year-olds that parents have trusted us to put wise folks in front of them, what investment advice or how they should be looking at investment at this point in their life? Using your tools or? Well, I mean, each person has a different, you know, like, like I can't tell somebody, you know, what they like or don't like, you know, like, like when I tell my own kids that are a little older than, you know, than the students here, you know, like what they should do, they don't, they don't care what I say. Yeah. Well, may, l let me let me reword that question a little bit. How should they be looking at investing their money between eighteen and twenty-four? What what kinds of things should they be looking at? So I will give you the line that I use all the time, which is, when you're twenty-three or twenty-four years old and you close your eyes to take a nap, you're going to wake up and you're gonna be 50. And you're gonna say, where the hell did my whole life just go? And I didn't, do, I didn't, I didn't learn how to invest anything. It's, it's, just, it's what happens to everybody. You just, life goes through, life moves so fast. And I think that one of the real keys to 
um, to investing is just starting early. It doesn't matter what you do. But, but we are believers in, um, obviously, in risk taking, but also I, I like the, to think of things in law of large numbers, which all of you have studied. And the law of large numbers is essentially you need to, even if you don't have a lot of money, you still need to spread things around. Like there's no reason you should ever be all in on anything. And, and so I think that from an investment standpoint, try everything. You know, like you should try some digital assets. You should try some equities. You should try some derivatives. You can try some, um, some alternative investments, some digital collectibles. That could be an NFT. That could be something else. But you should try everything and commit small amounts of money to everything and figure out what you like. You know, some, some of you are going to love trading and other ones are gonna hate it and they're gonna to love to be passive about their investments. Some of you are gonna say, hey, I'd much rather buy a piece of real estate. And other people are gonna say, hey, you know what? I would much rather trade sneakers on eBay, whatever it is. Um, and a lot of you are gonna maybe come out and be futures or options traders. I don't really know. But just spread the wealth. I mean, even if the wealth is small. Now, you've advocated risk. You've, yeah. you've said it at least a few times. Is there something that's too risky, or is there a way to look at, hey, don't go nowhere near these kinds of things? No, not in the world of finance. The only thing you need to stay away from as, as young entrepreneurs, investors, are things that are illiquid. Because at your age, what you care about, and actually for everybody in this room, even for me, I stay away from things where there's no liquidity. Because mm -hmm. where there's no liquidity, remember, liquidity is also, has a, has, is complemented um, with, with, if there's liquidity, there's, there's efficiency and there's fair value. If there's no liquidity, there's no efficiency, there's no fair value. And so you have to wait for somebody to take you out of the position. What you want to be when you're an investor is invested in things where you can always move on to something else. If you think whatever you're invested in is rich or if it's potentially cheap or if you want to just change and pivot. So that's my main kind of thing is just stay, stay liquid. And, okay. and, and it's hard to stay liquid if you go into alternative investments. That's the only thing to be careful about. Now, now I am going to ask specifically about your product. What, what can they do in your product or what would you suggest they do to inform them better on how they take these kind of risks that you highly encourage them to take? Well, we create like 10 hours of content a day for the last 12 years nonstop. So we have like a billion hours of, you know, <laughs> content. It's all free. But um, really, we just try to get people engaged in stuff. Like it doesn't, like all I can do is, or all anybody that works with us can do is like bring you to the game. You know, it's like, you know, whatever, we, we have like a different sport instead of, instead of, you know, baseball or football or whatever it is, we just bring you to kind of a financial arena. And then when you get there, like that's on you. So, so our job it, it, as being fintech innovators, our job is to facilitate opportunity. So whatever you want to do or whatever you want to do or whatever you want to do, we build the technology so you can do it. Like that's it. I, I, I can't make you any money because I don't know what's going to happen next either. Like, but you should have the opportunity to do whatever it is that you want to do as well as you guys, as well as everybody in this room. You should have the opportunity to do whatever it is that you want to do. And that's the cool thing. That's what really good innovation is. It gives people, it, facil it facilitates other people's opportunities. Okay. Well, first of all, that, these have been some great words of wisdom. I, I'd like to offer the mic one last time to some of my students that are here in the room to see if there's any, oh, there's, there's a question or two here. So hold on a second. Like they don't want to cut back on spending for 
Republicans are wanting to, Democrats are simply asking to raise the debt soon. We should be reaching it early June. And so my question to you is, how do you feel about uh, investing in a startup company right now uh, in this environment? And what is some advice that you can give us on what securities or what uh, investments we should be looking at, what industries, maybe give us an example of what a good portfolio would look like right now. Sure. So here's what I love about this question. So, so you have to understand um, a, a little background of, of us that you don't really know is that we don't really believe in fundamental analysis or technical analysis. My whole focus, we're kind of like weird quants that just look at, I'm an efficient market theorist. What that means is that everything that's known is already priced into the market. So, so I don't worry about like what's about to happen, like with the debt ceiling or anything else, because everything that's known about that is already priced into wherever the markets are trading today. But the real interesting part of the question is, and I don't know whether you think that we're in a good economic time or a bad economic time right now, but it doesn't matter that much. I love building businesses when everybody else, when the level of fear is incredibly high. So I, we built Thinkorswim when the market was crashing in 2000. When it started to crash in March of 2000 for the next two years, that's when we built the platform. We built Tasty in 2011 when the market was essentially going sideways and there was huge volatility because there, the, there was a fiscal cliff and all this debt crisis back then and all these countries were you know, threatening bankruptcy and things like that. So I love it when there's confusion, chaos, and levels of fear really high because that's when opportunity is the best. You don't want to build stuff when everything's good because that's when everybody's complacent. You want to build things when everything's bad and everybody's scared and then you're the only person building stuff. So I like building things in bad environments, not necessarily in good environments, but you know, it is what it is. You, 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 know, you take your shot. And, and I also think you should think about things like in, that the world is very efficient. There's so many trillions of dollars chasing of returns right now that I wouldn't worry about that, oh my God, everybody's wrong or anything like that. I, I just don't think about things that way. If you want to know what sectors, you know, like that was one of your questions. That's really, you know, that's, I'm a contrarian. So I like buying sectors that are cheap. Like right now you could argue banking and financial stocks are on the cheap side. I like selling stocks that are expensive. You could argue that machine learning and AI is really expensive right now. Now you might think, hey, that's gonna be, so they're gonna stay expensive for the next 10 years. Maybe they will, but I don't wanna own those stocks right now. Let's I, go ahead. I hope that answers your question. Did that answer your question? <laughs> tech stocks have, in 2023, the NASDAQ and tech stocks have outperformed everything. They underperformed everything last year. In 2022, they've outperformed everything in 2023. So you're in the right stocks right now. They've been doing great. I mean, if it was me, yeah, I'd probably lighten up a little bit. But it's, it's your call. See, that's the beauty of it. You know, like, that's a market. You think one thing, I think something else. That's, that's what I love. So Tom, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close this way. Uh, I ask every speaker, I believe that success leaves clues. You've obviously been extraordinarily successful. If you were to leave one clue with the young folks that are here on what they could do that could lead to their path of success, what would that one clue be, that one clue? So this is going to be a little different than maybe others have said. OK. But um, learn. Be really good at explaining why you're different. Like everybody's really good at explaining what they've been taught to explain, but very few people are really good about articulating what differentiates them. You know, why they're gonna add value to you. Like I don't think life is necessarily about Passion is a given. And I think the thing that's underestimated is differentiation. So I like people that can articulate, you know, hey, this is why 
this is why I'm this is why I'm different. This is why I make sense for to work for you. This is why it makes sense to to maybe you're raising capital, maybe you're coming to work for somebody, but I love kids that in an interview can differentiate themselves mm. because to me that's where there's this incredible value. Okay. Let's give a round of applause for our speaker today. Dean Kraft, if you wouldn't mind coming up, we'd like to share a gift with you. Also, we have a tradition here in this series. <laughs> we got one for you to carry home as well. We, <laughs> we, we get all of our guests, that's all of our guests, our younger and our slightly older younger guests to sign off on this as just sort of a remembrance of your time spent here with us. And we'd like to close it with one of your signatures as well. And we have one for you to take and one that we keep here Thank you. as well. So uh, we, uh, please, uh, students, uh, and everyone's my student, just FYI, you just don't know it yet. You'll be enrolled next semester. Um, so everyone to sign off on this, that we'd really appreciate that. Uh, Dean Kraft, I'm going to give you the mic. Thank you very much. Please have out a round of applause for our speaker. And also a big thank you to Dr. Carson for setting this case up. It's so incredibly valuable to us to have this kind of insight from people who've been uh, entrepreneurs, the people who've proven in the field of battle that they can do it, and you certainly have done that. So congratulations to you on your success. Thank you. Greatly appreciate you being here. It's a token of our appreciation. Thank you. And uh, you know, enjoy your time, and I hope you have uh, had a great visit here to campus. We are, it, it's, it's very easy, I won't burden you with it, but it's very easy for us to articulate why the kind of education we provide here is unique. So we're very happy to have you here. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, and this place is absolutely spectacular, beautiful. I mean, thank we had you. no idea. Well, we, were, we were walking in a piece of history here. It's, it's amazing. Thank you. And there are a lot of, shot, a lot of movies shot on this campus. I can we imagine. can talk about that afterwards. Yeah. We, we also have a special treat. Uh, we pulled on one of our alumni who is a musician, and we've been trying to fuse music and innovation and culture together. And uh, this is the second time he's been able to put together a collective of artists. So as we close out, we're going to turn it over to Trey. If you